You have found the Shanty Pants Show. Hello, it's Shanny, the least influential influencer that there ever was. With a heart full of laughter and a journey that runs deeper than the trendiest bake up pe- pel- pellet, 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 pellet. You may know me from my ridiculously comedic fashion and makeup tutorials on social media, but guess what? There's so much more to the story. I was born, raised, and married in a cult. When I left the cult at 31 years old, I had no knowledge about real life or how to process what I had been through. I felt very alone. The past couple of years, I've been on an incredible journey of learning, growing, and recovering, and I'm excited to share this with you. I'll bring you stories from the cultiverse, where many cult survivors and experts share their knowledge and experiences. Their stories are more than inspiring. They're a roadmap to self-discovery and resilience. So get ready for a podcast that's part comedy, part wisdom, and a whole lot of heart. If you feel alone in your journey, my hope is that that will change once you hear these stories. Welcome to the Shanty Pants Show. Thank you so much. Kate, for being here today on the Shanty Pants Show. We are so excited to have you. And why don't you go ahead and give us a little brief introduction of who you are, and then we'll go from there. Thanks, Shanny. I'm really excited to be here ever since meeting you um, last year, and I just really enjoy what you do in the world. So thanks for having me on. Uh, my name is Kate West, and I'm a writer. My day job is as an editor in the book publishing industry. And I volunteer for Tears of Eden, which is a nonprofit to help survivors of spiritual abuse within evangelicalism. So those are my three big things. I'm also starting a new podcast um, with a few friends called Survivors Discuss, where we talk about faith deconstruction and um, trauma survival. So a lot of things going on. Um, and my new book is coming out in April, which is called Rift, a memoir about breaking, a memoir of breaking away from Christian patriarchy. Um, so yeah, a lot to, lot to talk about. Yes. Oh, I'm so excited about your podcast. This is news to me and this is going to be amazing. That will be so great. We yeah. need more things like that. I, I'm doing it with Sherry Smith and Claire okay. McIver Heath, who's in Australia, and we've all survived similar high control groups, and we're trying to create panel discussions about about different topics. So we've done um, female empowerment and bodily autonomy. We've done racism in the church, and coming up, we're doing a special episode about cults with Yanya Lalich and Nikki Yay. G. So I'm excited. Lots of things to talk about. Okay, so very, very exciting about the podcast because obviously I love podcasts and I can't wait to go listen to this. And I can't believe I didn't know about it. That's very sad. Uh, so I will be going and listening. And I think you, oh, you were kind of talking, or you know, you did talk a little bit about the um, kind of what you guys do and what you discuss. And I think I'm, I'm very excited to go listen. I think it's so valuable for people that come from groups like us to kind of hear the back and forth between others that have come from the same. Uh, recently, my sister and I have done a couple of podcast episodes here on the Shanty Pants show, and it was just kind of random. I'm like, hey, you want to be on the podcast? Just like we did some live episodes, and I had wanted to try that. And so, of course, I dragged the sister in to do that with me. And so I, um, I, we did a couple episodes, the response I got from those episodes, which were like, you know, not edited, nothing. I just did them live and put them out there. The response was so crazy. And, and I think it was just more that we're sisters. We know each other. Um, we have grew up in the same home, the same controlling kind of group, but different perspectives. Um, so I think it's so valuable for people to kind of hear that back and forth and kind of the more discussion around uh, these type of groups. It just, I think it's different than what we have, like what I have going on here with where I'm interviewing a person. And of course, this is valuable. We want to hear stories. And I, I think there's so much value there. But it was interesting to me to see the difference like, oh, OK, there is a need for both mm -hmm. because um, it, it's just it's a different format, you know, so mm -hmm. I'm excited to go listen to yours and see um, 
see what you guys are doing there. That's very oh, exciting. Thanks. So, and I, I love yes. the episode with your sister because you're right. It's It feels different to hear about a conversation between two people who went through the same or similar things. And I think for a lot of us, we don't have family members or we might not have the same connections. So being able to listen in on a conversation, if you don't have that, can be really helpful because you might not be able to process that with someone in your life at the moment. Right. I didn't even think about that, but so true. And and I am so grateful, you know, obviously get asked all the time, like, are your parents still in? Are your, you know, so do you have siblings still in? And thankfully for me, I don't. Everyone's out. My husband's um, parents are still in, but I didn't have like a great relationship with them anyway. So it's not like it affects my day to day life as if it were my parents. Um, so, yeah, I am very thankful for that. All right. So let's start hearing a little bit about your story and your background, where you came from. Um, and then obviously we'll get to kind of where we are today. So you can go back as far as you want with uh, your childhood and kind of how you ended up in this group. Okay. Um, it's hard to know exactly how much detail to go into because <laughs> there's a lot. But so you can stop yeah. me at any moment and just we can. Oh, yeah. No, I love it. Um, I want to hear it all. But I was born into a conservative Christian family. I would have thought them to be, thought us to be a typical mainstream Christian family at the beginning. Um, I was baptized. We were Presbyterians. And the older I got, the more extreme the teachings that we were drawn to became and the more fundamentalist my family became. Um, the more controlling my father became. And so as I was writing this book, it was easy to see this escalation into a more extreme version of living. And that's how I became a stay-at-home daughter in the Christian patriarchy movement. And I didn't leave until I was 25. So it took me a long time to get out on my own. Um, but, you know, starting out when I was a baby, I don't think anyone would have predicted that would have happened to me. You were living at home until you're 25. Exactly. Yeah. Until, wow. And so what did your kind of like your as a child, let's say, did you feel like this was a normal home? This is kind of how everyone lives. Or did you understand like people live differently? It was normal for me, but I understood that we were different because when I was little, we lived in a neighborhood and... Um, I was the only homeschooled kid on the block. So I understood I'm the only one home during the day and all these other kids are going to school and I'm being taught something different. And I was told that that was to protect me and to make me a godly warrior for Jesus. And so I understood that we were different in that way, but I didn't know anything different for myself. So I didn't really know what yeah. that experience would have been like. It, what age did you start like thinking I don't or did you ever I don't like this this is different I wish I was like that family did you ever have that or did you have enough like influence from your church group that you had enough friendships and stuff that you were kind of satisfied I was a very isolated child so I didn't have a lot mm -hmm. of friendships and I did fixate on things in the outside world like um lunch boxes I was fixated on having a lunch box and having a locker and I thought just having your mm -hmm. own thing and like being able to put your own stuff in it and nobody else would have the key that to me seemed like freedom and I don't know if I ever communicated that to anybody but those those kind of things happened early on and then the older I got the more I realized how stuck I was and how limited my choices were um especially as I became an adult. So yeah, there was little things I was out when I was a child. And then as I got older, it became more and more restricted as well. And then what did your like day-to-day -day life look like or week to week or whatever, as far as your involvement with the church? Obviously it sounds to me like the con high control of the church kind of bled into the family and made that more extreme. So how did that kind of look in your day-to-day -day life? So I was homeschooled. So my day-to-day -day life was me doing um, very conservative homeschooling curriculum. And when I was younger, my mom would teach me 
And then as I got older, I was given the books and I taught myself. Um, mm-hmm. So a lot of it was just reading these Christian history books and things like that or listening to audio tapes from pastors as my education. That was a lot of my day. Um, I also did like piano lessons for for most of my childhood. So I had some outside activities, but the biggest part of our week was going to church and being part of our church family. And when I was a teenager, that church that we were part of, um, I would consider it very high control. It was in a, in a quote unquote normal denomination, but the pastor was this charismatic leader we, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of room for nonconformity. Everybody had to be homeschooled and things like that. So my life was every single day was inside this bubble. Mm-hmm. And my dad was in charge of everything in my life because in Christian patriarchy and when I say that term, like some people are like, well, what actual group were you in? Like, that's what we called it. We called it Christian patriarchy and it still exists, mm-hmm. but people don't always use that term. And it's, it's more of a movement than a specific group. But within Christian patriarchy, the dad of the family is the ruler. And mm-hmm. so the wife and the children are below him and he makes all the decisions and guides everybody. And he's responsible for them before God and all these these uh, quote-unquote biblical teachings. Um, So every aspect of my life was controlled by him until I was 25 and I left. Um, So, you know, as a child, most people don't ask questions because children don't have a lot of rights in this country. But then even as an adult, I don't think people understood what was happening to me because I was in an adult body, but I didn't understand that I had adult rights or Mm. that I could move out. So Mm. I just was brainwashed and secluded so much that I didn't understand. Do you have siblings? I do. I have two older siblings and then a younger brother. They were all homeschooled as well. Well, actually, my two older siblings went to the church school. Oh. And so this is part of the progression of my family because uh, my two older siblings started at public school then they went to a Christian school. Then they went to the church school. And then I was homeschooled. And then my younger brother was homeschooled as well. So it became more and more restrictive. My sister is nine years older than me. And my brother is my older brother is six years older than me. So they were my high school age. And so I think my parents probably figured it's harder to homeschool a teenager when they haven't been started off that way. And it would be yeah. easier to start me off that way. I did, I did actually go to the Christian school for a few months in kindergarten, mm. and then they pulled okay. me out. What about your siblings? So what was the difference there as far as what the guys were allowed to do versus the girls? Did that ever become a problem within the household? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, like I said, it became more restrictive. As the older we got, my sister did have a job okay. when she was like 20 years old because she was also told to stay home. But she was allowed to have a job for a little bit. And then something happened and my dad changed his mind and she wasn't ever allowed to work ever again. So after that, I wasn't allowed to work. Um, Women, you know, we were taught as girls that we needed to grow up and be a godly wife, raise kids and homeschool them. And why do you need a job when dad's going to pay for everything and your husband's Mm going to pay for everything after that? So. There's no sense of independence, Um, whereas my younger brother, he was able to take some community college classes and he had a job, even though he still lived at home as well after turning 18. So, I mean, less, still was very restricted, but less restrictive. Okay. And now, um, are any of your siblings still living at home or have they all left? No, we all we all got out in very different, very dramatic ways. <laughs> wow. Okay. We all have very different stories, actually. Did your older siblings get out before you did? Oh, yes. So my, okay. my older brother, he joined the Army when he was 17. Oh, so wow. he just kind of, you know, was like, I'm done. And 
we lost contact with him for a while. Um, but now, you know, we're, we're all my siblings and I, we get along great now. And, and I'm so thankful that we, uh, we found a way to awesome. like have relationships again. And my older sister got married through this church and the, we, we did the biblical courtship thing. So, um, she married, got married that way. And fast forward more than a decade later, she's, she was divorced. Um, and there was abuse in that situation. So I'm really thankful that she was able to find her way out of that because that was really difficult. I mean, in some ways, much more difficult than what I had to go through. And I, so basically for a woman, your out was to get married. Mm -hmm. And so, but within the church, right? Right. You married within the church. Did very many people, you know, court or shop outside the church or was it all kind of within your group? It was, um, we had this, there was this running joke in our church that there weren't enough young men. Oh, so we had so many teenage girls oh my and gosh. teenagers, not, we weren't adults yet. And all the adults were talking about this problem of how they're going to get all these girls married. And so we would do things like family camps where you would invite churches from all over the country to come. And then you could like have your parents mingle and set you up. Um, oh. There was a dating site that was for homeschool alumni. I know one person who got married that way. And so so things like that. And we did have a woman live with us because she didn't have a dad. Mm. And my dad became her head of household. And he wrote letters to every church in the denomination in that region to ask if they had anybody interested in courting her. And I was like, I am never going to do that. I was so embarrassed. Yeah, that would be mortifying. Oh, okay. This is sounding so, so, so familiar. Oh no. <laughs> uh, definitely lots of lots of uh similarities we have. Your family camps um sound we have we just call them camps. Okay. But uh very, very similar. That was where we went fishing. Um and it was like like uh, uh, people say, Well, was yours an arranged marriage? And I'm like, No, it wasn't necessarily arranged, but you just knew if you found someone that you connected with, you knew from a very young age, oh, I'm going to marry him because it's like you had to tag him so that no one else would. <laughs> and so like at 12, I I never had boyfriends. I just at 12, I knew who I was going to marry and that's who I buried. And um, wow. but yes, at camps, it was always the like thing to be prowling because that was your opportunity to see more than, you know, the hundred people that you saw all week long. Yeah. A home so <laughs> I mean you're whole you're told that your whole life that your purpose is to get married and then like what else are you supposed to think about when you you know right hang out with other teenagers yeah that was it I mean and too like I know for us that was your your friend base it wasn't mm -hmm. so for us we did go to public school not everyone in our group there was a select few that went to public school my parents let us go to public school. But even with that, you have this outside influence, but you're trained like it's bad, 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 bad. They're bad, bad, bad. And so even though you're mingling with your school, I call them school friends, they were literally only your friends at school. We didn't do any extracurricular activities. You weren't allowed to go to their houses. Like it was very, very limited as friends as you can be with just seeing them at school. So N you you never would think like oh I might be able to date him someday never that wasn't like a thought because it wasn't an option and so you still had this very small pool to pull from for yeah. um, a potential spouse but yeah you were so geared towards like you said marriage and having kids right away that um, that was your focus and I remember in high school I was engaged and I remember I wouldn't wear my ring, but I brought it to school because my friends were like, no, you're not. And I'm like, yes, I am. So I brought my ring to school one day and they're like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> you really are engaged. How and old were you? How old were you when you got engaged? Um, I think I I was probably 17, 18. Okay. Yeah, I was I would have been probably junior, senior. And they and probably thought got, that was crazy. Oh, insane. That yeah, would have been which normal it is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Well, and honestly, 
like I did, I waited until I was 19 because I graduated and then I waited almost a full year before we actually got married. And I don't remember why, but I was 19 when we got married. But that was kind of old and weird, too, to wait that long. Like, uh, you've just graduated high school. Why aren't you getting married? Like, why are you what, waiting? Why the wait? <laughs> yeah. I, why would you wait? Which actually, it probably had more to do with, like, his job and his income and stuff because you have to be able to, like, afford to live on your own. Because we did the same thing. You lived with your parents, even the guys, um, until you got married. And then it was like, now you're on your own and good luck. Yeah. Which was so healthy. <laughs> so helpful. <laughs> And I had a couple of my high school friends that came to my wedding and like our weddings were very like everyone in our group was invited and we called ourselves um, assemblies. So we would have different assemblies, which were our different like locations. And so we were up here above Sacramento and we were known as the Sacramento assembly. But then in California, we had like three other assemblies and then in a couple different states we had some different assemblies so whenever there was a big event or a wedding or anything anyone from any of the groups is welcome to come so it's not like an invite only type wedding if there's anything wow. i could redo it would be my whole wedding experience wow so we had to rent this like massive ballroom down in sacramento and there was over 600 people in attendance. Oh, my goodness. And yeah. And it's like, and half these people, like I know all of them because you see them at camps and, you know, maybe one's friends with your dad or whatever. So it's not that I didn't know them, but it's not like I had relationships with, I mean, maybe I had relationships with like five people in the whole room, you know? Oh, wow. So it was just weird. But anyway, so my high school friends, a couple of them came and they were just like, oh my <laughs> gosh. Like, she's weird here too she was weird at school but she's weird here too oh my god uh it was very 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 weird and but i'm gonna guess i'm gonna guess no <laughs> drinking and no dancing oh no 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 yeah no <laughs> and we and luckily because our weddings were so good luckily we didn't do like receptions like a normal wedding oh, okay now it was just like a cake reception so in the back of the room you would cut the cake everyone get a piece of cake and you leave yeah. so very like not a party not like it's more nope. like a gathering time to visit with people you haven't seen for a while and look at this nothing... beautiful building <laughs> there's nothing more fun than getting 600 cult members together <laughs> sober to talk <laughs> and eat cake oh my gosh like I was just talking with some. Oh, I know who it was. Um, well, Shantae, she was at uh, right, St. Yeah. Louis. And we were just texting the other day. And we were like, man, if we could, like, some of these people drunk or high would be so much fun. Like, if we could, like, <laughs> have this experience, I feel yeah. like it could be amazing. And we could do a whole TV show off of it. Just relax but... your shoulders just a little bit. <laughs> right, right. Quit talking in word salad words. Just talk like a normal human. Yeah, it would be amazing. I think it would be hilarious. That would be great. <laughs> but yeah, so lots of similarities between uh, you and I, I think. But again, you were just primed for marriage. So in high school, you know, other kids are talking about college and careers and what they're going to do. And I'm just like, well, you get married. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Why make plans? You know, you're just right. going to get married. And I feel like I had it very, uh, I was very fortunate. My family was like a rebellious family in our group, which now we're like, woohoo. Um, <laughs> but at the time it was like, uh, my sister and I put a lot of stress on our parents because we called them men's meetings because men are obviously the ones in charge. So whenever my sister and I would screw up, my dad would have to go to a men's meeting for like six hours and figure out how to fix us. Um, oh, wow. But we were very rebellious. So we did go to school, which was one of the big things, but we still had to like dress how we always dressed, which was like skirts and, you know, no tank tops or anything like that. Very, very conservative. You weren't supposed to cut your hair, makeup, um, nail polish, you know, kind of tattoos, all that stuff. The norm. Um, and so, yeah, it was very, it was hard to get through school. Like I was thankful that we went to public school, but at the same time, like we went through hell going through public school because we were not normal. Like we were definitely the odd ones out when it came to um, being in public school. So it wasn't like a great ex fun experience, but I think it, it gives me a good perspective now, like raising children, um, like when it comes to bullying and things like that, I could relate very easily. So I'm like, hey, 
let me talk yeah. to you. Like, and um, so so I'm thank I'm thankful for it in many ways, but uh, it was definitely not a fun experience. And then one of my kids wants to homeschool right now, and I'm like, no, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Please experience high school. Like, please, yeah. like you have to go to the dances and do all the fun things because that's what normal people do. Like, we didn't get to do that, but. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh my I gosh. I remember when I, another thing my dad let us do is have jobs. And um, when I was, I probably was a senior in high school and I was um, doing like a waitress job at a local restaurant. And one of the, my friends that I worked with there, he had gone on a trip and he brought everyone gifts back when he came back and he brought me earrings. Well, I had my ears pierced because we weren't allowed to. And he felt it was like one of those moments you just don't forget because he felt so bad, like thinking this like 17 year old didn't have her ears pierced. Like, I'm sorry. I just <laughs> got earrings for all the girls, you know? Oh, no. And but it's one of those things you don't forget because it was so embarrassing. And then you're trying to explain to and at work, I could kind of avoid I had to wear skirts still, but you could kind of avoid a lot of the like uncomfortable conversations because you only saw them, you know, enough that you could just get away with it. And you're wearing like mostly uniform with the skirt, of course. And so it's, you know, a little bit more even. But <laughs> that experience, I'm like, oh, man, here we go. I thought I could get away with kind of being normal in this situation. But no, I do not have my ears pierced. And it's not because I'm afraid of needles. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that was fun. That was fun. But what now what was your guys? Did you guys have to? um dress real modestly what was your kind of dress code I mean at the time I thought our family was I mean liberal is not the right word less conservative because we were allowed to wear pants at home okay yeah and baggy pants I should clarify right yes um and longer shorts mm -hmm. you know not on Sundays you know that didn't really matter too much because we were homeschooled so we didn't see people um, and we lived in the mountains, so it was easier to like navigate, <laughs> get, away, get away with it. Yeah. So, um, but at church, there was quite the mix. There were people who would wear head coverings. There were people who like, you know, head to toe covered, um, denim jumpers type of people. And so there was just like a wide variety. Um, but everything had to be modest, um, like, you know, there was like a bare minimum. And I remember one girl got in trouble because she had a skirt above her knees. And it was just like this whole church wide scandal because of what she wore. <laughs> and yes. yeah, all these men were noticing. So, like, and that's a problem. So creepy. So, yeah. so creepy. How did it, how did it feel? Cause like for us, modesty was obviously a huge thing. And I, when I talk with my sister, we talk about how like we were like, over sexualized almost because you were so self-conscious like I'm even still will have oh, things yeah. inside that I'm like oh but is that and I'm like shut up just wear it like I don't care but like where you're so like so above just your normal like everyone has their own standards right like you know and that's great and I totally respect that but this was so far above that and it was because we don't want to have make make the men sin and right. so, so much was put on us. And this is from like birth basically on as like, well, you know, you, even as a five-year-old kid could make a man sin. And it gives us kind of a lot of power now that I think about it, but, um, which is surprising. They probably didn't think of that side of it, but, but awful, like to grow up in that kind of environment where it's like, well, if you're not modest, it's you, it's your fault for mm -hmm. causing these men to sin. And that sounds kind of similar. Yeah, I, I mean, that's how I actually, one of the first chapters of my book starts out with this early memory. I think I was around five and we were on vacation and I had a hand-me-down swimsuit, but it was a two-piece. I was five and my dad told me to go, told my mother to tell me to go change. And I was just so confused, you know, because I'm I'm five years old and I didn't understand but it started then like that that shame about my body and just like constantly aware of how men specifically my dad looked at me and that was really problematic like the entire time I lived with him 
he would inspect my clothes and it's just like while I was wearing them you know and it's just like really creepy in a way to, to have your dad inspect you like that very yeah <laughs> not normal this is not what you know a normal dad does like oh my god right but i wouldn't have known that i didn't know that no yeah the way it made me feel and that's again where i'm so thankful is that my dad wasn't that way like he was clueless he just knew when he'd get calling into a min meeting like what did we do this time you know and (laughs) and he was my parents were the same like as you were talking like at home we were able to wear again like baggy shorts or uh we had a swimming pool so and it was just three girls in the family. So that was lucky for us. So we were able to swim Phew. and yeah, <laughs> and wear bathing suits and stuff. But it was always so awkward, like when we'd have friends over or when we go to friends' houses that have pools, because everyone would wear clothes over their bathing suits to swim. And we were so used to just swimming in swimsuits. And our and my mom, I remember telling us, like, you don't have to put clothes on over your bathing suit, like you're swimming, because we were like practical like that. And you didn't want to like drown. So but but we would do it because we were the only ones that won it. And so we put a big T-shirt and culottes on over our bathing suits and hope not to drown. And, and even that, it's like dangerous. They're so, it's so dangerous. Like, it's, <laughs> there's so many things. I'm like, all in the name of modesty. Let me tell you, you stand up out of that pool with wet clothes on you. There's a lot more to look at than if you were just like in a normal bathing suit looking like everyone else. Right. Like if you went to a public pool. Guess who's going to be looking? Or the beach? Oh, that was fun. Guess who's <laughs> looking at... Everyone's looking at us. They probably wouldn't have even noticed us if we were dressed normally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to hear more about your story. I'm talking a lot. So you got out when you were 25. Did you just up and leave? Was there events that led up to it that you're like, oh, I can leave? Or how did kind of that go? Okay, so it was like a step-by-step me coming awake and figuring out that this is not okay and I need to get out or I'm not going to survive this Mm -hmm. um it just like literally became that clear to me like how bad this was for me um when I was 18 my parents moved from Colorado to Hawaii for my dad's job and so I was writing about this the other day because people always thought like wow you're so lucky you get to go to Hawaii and like live in paradise and It's such a beautiful place and a beautiful culture. And I was so isolated and so controlled there that it was like a prison. Um, And it's it's very hard to get that across when it's like, yes, I have privilege. I I was able to live there for a time in my life. Um, But I didn't have much of a choice about anything, you know. So it's both both of those things. Um, So right after I graduated from homeschool, we moved there. And, you know, this is a big part of the book is, is my family helping start a church plant. I started teaching piano lessons because my dad was encouraging me to, like, teach other homeschoolers and people he worked with. And so I was able to get some money that way. Um, and then I had a courtship when I was 20. And... I got my heart broken really bad because my dad ended the relationship after a really long time of this going on. And I thought I was going to get married. And um, I talk about this. I don't want to I don't want to like tell too much detail because I don't want to minimize how complicated the situation was. Um, But I just at the end of it, my dad told me I needed to repent because I was having too many emotions. I was being too attached to this person. And that was sinful because I was cheating on my future spouse and and hurting his future spouse. Um, And so at that moment, like, my heart knew, like, that's not true. Like, you can't tell me to say, I deserve hell for feeling love for someone. It doesn't make any sense. And so that's when I realized I'm never going to let this happen to me again, where I'm going to let my dad take away somebody if I, if I love them. So that was like, that was when I was 20, right? And I didn't get out till I was 25. So 
you know, I'm, tr- I'm trying to figure out how to live with, with this idea. I still have this belief that I need to obey my father to obey God. So that's what's so tricky about spiritual abuse is you think, well, I, I, I don't think this is all right, but as long as I obey, then God will bless me, right? So it's like justifying the abuse that was happening because it was escalating. The emotional verbal abuse was escalating in my 20s. And it took a long time for me to like really, for it to really click that I don't think if there is a God, he would want God, he, they, she would want me to be abused. I don't think God would want me to sit here and suffer because my dad, maybe he doesn't have the best intentions for me, actually. And so having to make that mental leap took so many, so much time. That is like the bigger arc of it. And then along the way, there were like a handful of people, like a couple people who said small things to me like, are you okay with this? Or what if you went to college? And at the time, I had all the answers rehearsed, you know, like, well, I don't go to college because I'm going to become a wife and a mother, and that's what God wants for me, blah, blah, blah. But just them asking that question, I registered that, I tucked it in the back of my head, and I thought about it once in a while, you know, and then th- those questions build up. And I was like, yeah, what if I, what if I moved out? What if I, I don't know, went to college? I was imagining what a different life could be like and not knowing too much about the outside world that's difficult to do so that that's the place I was at in my early 20s is just sorting through that and and depression and anxiety and my dad's control tightening and then I was I was ready to like move out and find my older brother and like move in with him because I he was the only person I talked to about this and then we got a new pastor and he had a lot of sons oh god (laughs) (laughs) and (laughs) i'm I'm opening this really weird but like um, (laughs) we know what's gonna happen (laughs) (laughs) then one of them became my best friend and and our relationship just grew over this time period in my early 20s and we fell in love and Mm. i was like well I'm not going to let my dad take this person away from me. And he was like, we need to help. We need to go through your dad and like keep it on the straight and narrow. Right. So we tried that and we were allowed to have a courtship for one week. And then my dad was like, never mind. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I was like, even though this is like a pastor's son. Yeah. He, he was like, maybe after he goes to college and has $40,000 and like then maybe. So at that point I'm like, your rules aren't making sense anymore um so (laughs) we basically had a secret relationship and decided that we wanted to get married and and that's what escalated me leaving he left first and then i followed him to michigan and we got married here that's where i live now and that was 10 years ago so yeah it's been and that's who you're married to right now yeah it is (laughs) Oh my God, what a great story. <laughs> and was that in Hawaii then? Yes, yeah. So okay. that's where we met and got engaged. And then we moved here to like start oh. a new life. And his family yeah. isn't quite as strict as mine. So okay. the church wasn't quite the same as my older church when I was a teenager. So mm. I just want to clarify that. Um, yeah. But still, it was really difficult to communicate, like, what was happening in my family. And David, my husband, is the only person who, like, really understood, like, because mm. he saw it, the way my dad treated me. He started treating him like that. And so he's the only person who's been through that with me, you know, wow. and and wanted me to make, make my own choices. Even though I did leave through marriage, technically, it was a very different kind of marriage than I was supposed to have. Mm-hmm. Um, because I did it on my own my own terms and now so you guys you got married did you get married like without your parents were they involved at all or did you leave and then get married we left and we left and got married and they did come to the wedding okay um okay. at that point I get in this into this in the book too like um certain kind of people when they're controlling like that they don't want other people to know how controlling they are so like um my dad showed up and like played the part you know, everything went fine. 
I mean, I don't have a relationship with him anymore, but at the time I was I was really thankful that they even came. And what about your siblings? Were they able to come as well? Yes, they all came. Okay. Yeah. That is such a great story. Well, and there's so many um and obviously you guys met when you were a little bit older, so that's probably a little different than like me. I knew my husband like forever since we were, you know, born. Okay. I left in April. We got married in June. Okay. So so pretty much your whole marriage has been a part of your deconstruction yeah like journey how has that been like ha- i it's just because i know how ours is and so <laughs> like ha- how has that been for you both i think because our families are slightly different it's it we've had like staggered experiences with this for me i was i had ptsd and i didn't know it and so the first few years of our marriage, I was like having panic attacks and like struggling to communicate and, you know, trying to figure out how to live on the outside world. And he hadn't been as isolated as I had been. So he didn't have that same anxiety about the same things. I was I was working through PTSD first and then like the once I started getting help and then like figuring out what I believe and then it just it just pushed me to analyze that whereas he didn't come from a place where he felt like he needed to and so he's only done that in the past few years so we've had like that's been interesting for me to be in a certain place with what i believe about the world and then him being in a different place and then figuring out how to live together and how to have you know what are our shared values and we still love each other and we want to live together and make this work And I was so afraid when I was, because I was deconstructing this a lot faster than him. I was like, he's going to leave because I'm becoming that, you know, I don't know what they would call me. I've been called all the names, but like. Like an actual independent woman and you should be. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And and then he just took in the, I like communicated to him. I learned how to communicate and then Mm. I communicated to him what I was thinking and feeling and over time, and I was like, I don't believe these certain things anymore. Mm. And it was like, at first, it was just like him processing that. And he's like, well, I, I love you and I want to be with you. Like, that doesn't matter. And so I don't think everyone gets that experience um, to be able to go through all that with a spouse and still like be able to accept each other because we've both changed so much, but we've had to learn how to evolve together and let each other be who we are you know mm-hmm. it's it's difficult it's and I'm, I'm not going to pretend it's easy we've done a lot of yeah. like marriage counseling and therapy and and stuff and yeah. it's still an ongoing process so right yeah well and that's so i think marriage and for anyone is not easy or even just partnership with anyone is not easy because yeah. living with another human is a learning experience and so i think when you come with less knowledge of what that could look like it definitely is um more challenging because Mm -hmm. you've got a lot of things to work through and with no um preparation really you know when you've lived in your household till under your dad's you know authority or whatever till you're 25 there's a lot you haven't experienced in life that is gonna yeah you have to learn and get through now do you feel like when when you talk about kind of you know your recovery type process did you start that do you feel like pretty early on or did you get married and kind of like okay this is our new life yeah I think I you know I was figuring out that what abuse meant Mm. and consent when I was still with my parents those were the things I was figuring out and that's what helped me leave is that information of this is not okay and yeah. then when I got out, I still wanted to be part of the church. And part of me wanted to, part of me felt like I had to be. So so we joined a church that felt less um, strict. And I thought at first, I was like, wow, the women are wearing pants. <laughs> I'm like, um, we don't only sing psalms, you know, like there's some <laughs> things that are like, to me, felt liberating. Yeah. Um, yeah. So at first, that was great, and then over time, being there, more things showed up, and like the more subtle side of 
patriarchy. And I realized even if you don't use that term, people are living that way in a lot of Christian churches. Um, even if maybe women have jobs, they still have to like submit to their husbands, mm-hmm. you know, or like say that they do anyways. Um, and a friend of mine at the church was in an abusive marriage and the church handled it, handled it very poorly. And yeah. I was like, they don't get, they don't get it. And so I tried like creating material to help educate people about abuse. And, wow. but then I had to get my husband's permission to, oh. to share it with the church. So it's like, I should have known, I should have known this was not the place for me. And then over time, they started having materials like in Sunday school from some of the the leaders that were part of my childhood, you know, women need to stay home stuff. And I was like, no, I'm not, I'm going to, so I spoke up (laughs) as much as I could. At the same time, I'm like deconstructing what I really believe on a faith level. And then I just, I know very clearly, like that is wrong. And then I'm trying to figure out what I believe anyways. So yeah, that, that's that been the past five years, I would say. So you've been out for 10 years and um, you're still married. I love it, though. I love <laughs> it. I love it. It's always like, I, like, I'm so surprised. I was not expecting your story to go that way because I um, I knew you were married, obviously, because I saw you guys. But I was like, didn't I was not expecting it to be from <laughs> when you were still there. So that's amazing, though. Like some of us. Well, and the sad thing is, like, in your, again, yours is a little different are a lot different than mine but because you were older and so I think that was different and when you met him and became friends obviously when you're older um and for us it was like we do each other forever and yeah. we're married and just expect like oh you just you're your best friends so you should get married and move in together and everything's peachy um and it's not how it goes no there's so many like including my sister where it doesn't work out there's so much divorce from my group rightfully so because most of these people should have never been married in the first place and they were giving given no preparation on what marriage is anyway in a proper way or in any way it was just you live with mom and dad then you move in with someone else so um so it is it is cool when i hear someone like oh my gosh you're still married me too not that it's been easy but you know for some of us it worked out but like not very many like no and and a lot of my friends you know when I was a teenager a lot of them are divorced and I think I'm so proud of them for getting divorced yes at some in some cases it was literally trying to survive by getting Mm -hmm. divorced because of the abuse that was happening so like I don't want to be really clear like a divorce is an option don't stay with someone who's hurting you, you know? And, Mm -hmm. and I'm really, my heart's broken over those friends who had to go through that because of what we were taught, you know? Oh yeah. And in some ways I'm lucky that way just because I didn't, I didn't get stuck in a marriage um, where abuse was happening. Yeah. And I don't think that's anything about me. I think that was just like kind of play of the cards <laughs> it turned out that way yeah yeah well and that's the thing i think because the men are given such power when they're given all this authority so i think that's another you know way that the abuse is so heavily used in these types of groups because the men have that authority and are given this power and so it's like yeah of course it's going to trickle into the home life mm-hmm. and and then women aren't given any power at all so they're used to just taking it and Oh, dealing with it on there and that's the thing too with help there's no one to go to it or you, you we would go to leadership if you had a problem with something and the ones I knew that were handled in abusive situations were handled exactly like what you said you 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 just shut up and deal with it like okay. submit to your husband basically oh it does sound terrible but submit to your husband and so you know, then people hear about that and they're less likely to go to get help. So they just deal with it in the first place because, you know, you're not going to get real help. And it's very, very sad. And it puts women in very dangerous situations. And then kids, too, because yeah. most of these women are pumping out the kids because that's your next job after getting married. Right. And well, I really am so thankful that you shared part of your story with us. I'm excited about your book coming out. I'm excited. I'm really excited to start go listen to your podcast because I can do that like today. But your book is coming out in April, you said? Yes. April 30th. 
okay. which is actually so. that um, last year we started or the the coalition for responsible home education started the day of the homeschool child so that's actually the same day and so I'm really excited that I get to oh. share the day with this it's kind of symbolic like you know homeschooled children growing up and we take back our voices and yes. try to protect the other homeschooled kids <laughs> I really really love that that is so exciting and I'm just so proud of you and writing this book um, because I've tried about three times now and had to put a stop to it until I'm ready. I know how hard it is even just to begin. So I'm very excited. But also you're an editor. So now that I know that, you're really in trouble yeah. because I'm going to be like, so I'm starting to write again. How you doing today, Kate? No, that, that um, is like my favorite thing is to talk to people about what they're writing. And yeah. So okay. Please do. <laughs> okay. But that's very, very exciting to have your own book out. And um, I'm excited for that to be available to everyone. And we'll definitely link that in the notes so everyone can find it as soon as it's available or pre-order it. I'm sure they could do that soon, too. Yes. Okay. I'll be leaving all that information for everyone in the notes. But I... Now I'm just like, I want to know it all. I want to know all the story. So I'm glad that the book is only a couple of months out. Is there anything else you would like to share with us? No, I really enjoyed it. It's really nice to talk to somebody who uh, is coming from a similar place. You know, mm -hmm. I, I enjoy doing these interviews and it's especially fun. I mean, fun is a strong word, but like with you, it's been fun. <laughs> yeah, I try to make it a little fun. Yeah, I mean, I it, is difficult. it is difficult to share these things. But when someone yeah. already understands like a baseline of what that feels like, we can laugh about it, you know, and we mm -hmm. can make jokes. And that's not, that might seem weird to other people, but it's really yes. healing to be able to laugh a little bit. Yeah. And uh, my audience is, they're used to it now because I, <laughs> every, every, I think every interview we have to laugh a little bit. So yeah. <laughs> it's, um, but it is, it's, it is hard. It's a serious situation. It's big discussions that need to be happening, but, um, but we have to be able to laugh about it. And that's why I love the ones with my sister too. We laugh a lot because most of what we're laughing at, it's ridiculous. Like when you, when you think about like, and then we like, I, I what like <laughs> you stayed till you were 25 what is wrong with you you know like it seems yeah. it seems so ridiculous but but it's real life and it is there's that control and like you said people think like oh you're 25 why can't you just leave well there's a lot more that goes into just leaving and I'm excited to read more details in your book about that but but it's a process it's not an easy thing for someone to just leave and for people that can't understand good I'm glad you can't understand that right, yeah. that means you that you were in a home like that uh but but yeah at some point we do have to kind of laugh a little bit though and otherwise we just cry all the time I feel like <laughs> or I would at least <laughs> yeah it's hard red stuff but it's so nice that we're having these conversations now I think when I left 10 years ago I didn't feel like anybody was talking about this kind of thing no. and so it was difficult to like crawl myself out of the hole yeah and yep. now I'm so thankful that more people are talking about it because I know there are lots of people still stuck in these situations yeah. so like the more we can talk about it the more people can get help because they information is is powerful and so yeah and that's why um I just I guess you know I just want to shout out Tears of Eden um, yes. Oh, Coffee. yeah. Talk a little bit about what you're doing now. Let's talk about that a little bit. So I, I'm volunteering with Tears of Eden on their editorial board, which means I work on the blog on the website and helping people tell their stories on our blog if they want to. Um, so sometimes people reach out to me. Sometimes I'll see something they posted on their blog and ask if we can repost it. Um, but it's just such a powerful thing to see people tell their stories um, when they want to and how they want to. And I think for, for a lot of people, just telling the story to themselves is what, what needs to happen. You know, not everybody wants to or needs to share publicly. So I don't want to just say that we have to do that. Um, but the people who have shared with us, it's just the kind of work I get excited about because we're building something new. We're building um, not a new church, not a new like cult, but just like a new way to relate to other people and to share our experiences and accept who we are and each other. 
and then move forward, you know, taking back our own stories. So that's just my part at Tears of Union, but um, we have other resources as well. We have virtual support groups, which are really, really needed. Um, we have a very long wait list because it's hard to finance these groups. And um, last year was our first, as you know, our first retreat. So that was really fun and exciting. We did that in correlation with the story jam. So just meeting people in person, like I, I hadn't met a lot of them in person. So that was really awesome for me. So yeah, so check out tearsofeden.org. Um, lots of resources there if you're if this story sounds familiar to you at all. Um, it can be helpful. I love what you guys are doing there. I think, again, it's getting these resources out there. Like you were saying, like 10 years ago, this wasn't, I never saw anything like this. But I really, really appreciate you sharing your story with us. It was so wonderful to meet you. And like I said, before we started this, I just, I wish we could just all hang out. I Maybe know. we should do like a Zoom hangout, you know, really, where we I'll can all like connect. I think that would be fun. That'd be fun. Um, it would be I think that would be really fun because I feel like now since Story Jam, I've gotten to know, well, a lot of you have been on the podcast now. And so I've got to know you from this, from doing the interviews, but then even just a little bit more so through social media. Now that we've met in person, it's been really fun to connect that way. And I'm like, oh, I know them better now. And so, but ugh, it was a great experience to meet everyone in person though. Yeah, you're the so, best. And when you came out on stage uh, and that, that, prairie dress which i'm assuming you got a target <laughs> yep it was i my heart was like so full i was like this is what i need to see <laughs> oh good i'm so glad <laughs> oh was that great. was fun though what a great that was such an amazing event well thank you so much for being here on the shannon pant show and Thanks, um yeah, and we'll have to chat again soon. And I'm excited about your book and um, you're busy. You're ahead. And hopefully we could connect again at some point. That sounds awesome. <laughs> Thank you for having Yay. me on. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you all for joining me for another episode of the Shanty Pant Show. I really appreciate you guys hanging out with me every week. You can find all of my links to all my social medias, anything your heart desires at shantypantshow.com. You can even find my amazing merch is back up and running there. And you can email me from there. All the things. All the things. Also, you always ask, how can you help me out with this whole podcast situation? You can subscribe to my podcast. You can leave reviews. You can share it with friends. I appreciate it all. So I am super excited to bring you guys the rest of the season. It's going to be amazing. And I'll see you next week.